for our message from the Word of God this morning. Acts 6 1 will be found on page 1156 if you're using the Bible we have there in the seats. Today is February 2nd, 2020. Groundhog's Day. So, happy Groundhog's Day to all of you. <laughs> Our text is going to be in Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. And the title of this morning's message is The Grecian Formula. <laughs> the Grecian Formula. And we begin with the story of. A young priest who decided to enter a monastery where he would be required to take a vow of silence. The head monk explained that he could only speak two words every ten years. Well, after Ten years of total silence, he reported to the head monk, and he said to him, Food bad. <laughs> and the head monk nodded, and the young priest went back to work. Then, after ten more years, he reported in to the head monk and said to him, Bed hard. And once again the head monk nodded and the priest went back to work. Finally, after ten more years of total silence, he reported in to the head monk and he said, I quit. <laughs> At which point the head monk shook his head and said, I knew this was coming. You've done nothing but complain for the past 30 years. <laughs> well, speaking of complaining... <laughs> Here in the early chapters of the book of Acts, the Lord's disciples are being given a taste of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And they've been living in perfect harmony the way that the Jews will someday live in the kingdom of heaven on earth. But... As we come now to Acts chapter 6, some people known as the Grecians are complaining. And the apostles have to come up with a formula to deal with their complaint. <laughs> the Grecian formula. I direct your attention at this time to Acts 6 and verse 1 where we read these words. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, with 3,000 getting saved, then 5,000, and now they're not even keeping count that the, the number is multiplying, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Because their widows were neglected in something called the daily ministration. 
Now, to begin with, we have to ask a question here. If I'm right, and the disciples here were getting a taste of the kingdom of heaven on earth, how come somebody's complaining? And does that mean when we get to the kingdom of heaven in heaven that there's going to be complaining up there? And believe it or not, the answer is yes. Don't forget what Paul says in your first reference in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3 where he says, We shall judge angels. And the reason that angels are going to need judging is because there's going to be some murmuring among them. Remember, that's not talking about judging them guilty or innocent. Only God can do that. And by that time, all the fallen angels will be judged. And they'll be in the lake of fire. No, Paul's saying that we'll be judging the holy angels. And as I'm sure you know, there's different kinds of judges. For instance, at the judgment seat of Christ... Believers like us, Paul says we all have to stand someday before the judgment seat of Christ. Believers like us aren't going to be judged guilty or innocent. Instead, the Lord's going to judge how you served Him after you got saved. Then there's the kind of judge that you'll see tonight in the Super Bowl. Some of those referees, we call them zebras because they wear the striped shirts. Some of those zebras are called line judges. They watch the line of scrimmage to see if any of the players jump off sides before the ball is snapped, right? It's called encroachment and it's against the rules. And you say, well, is that the kind of judging that angels will need? <laughs> Won't they all be playing by the rules up there? Well, that's just it. Football players, they don't mean to break the rules. They don't jump off sides deliberately on purpose. They know that that'll cost their team yardage in penalties if they do. They're just eager, eager to help their team and sometimes that eagerness crosses the line <laughs> and encroaches on the rights of other players. And when that happens, the line judge judges them. That's his job to let them know that they did something wrong. And that's how we're going to judge angels. Angels are sinless, but they're, they're not perfect. And in their eagerness to serve God, sometimes they're going to encroach on the rights of other angels. And when that happens, the one who got encroached on is going to murmur and complain. And then he's going to look to you to settle the dispute. Meanwhile, down here on the earth, the twelve apostles are going to be judging the twelve tribes of Israel, like the Lord told them in Matthew 19.28. Jesus said unto them, Ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And once again, that's not talking about judging them innocent or guilty. 
The only people who sin in the kingdom and, and need to be judged guilty are going to be unbelievers. And God will judge them by picking them up, carrying them over to the open pit of hell and dropping them in. Now, the, the Lord was talking about judging the twelve tribes of Israel the same way we'll be judging the angels. By settling disputes among those saved Jews in the kingdom. They too will be sinless, but not perfect. They'll need the twelve to settle their disputes just like we're seeing the need come up here in Acts chapter 6. Now what this means is that the Bible commentaries on this passage are wrong. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> They're wrong when they say that the kingdom program is starting to break down here. It's starting to unravel. They point out how the apostle, how the disciples have been living in your next reference, Acts 1, 14, 2, 1, 2, 46, and 4, 32. You know these verses. The, these all continued with one accord. They were all with one accord. And they continuing daily with one accord. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Well, they were living in perfect harmony, obviously. So when this comes up, the commentaries say, well, that, that perfect harmony is starting to unravel. But what they fail to see is that this is a picture of how that harmony is going to be maintained in the kingdom of heaven on earth someday and by us in the kingdom of heaven and heaven. Now if all that messes with your idea of heaven <laughs> and, and, and what heaven's going to be like, and I've got you to thinking that well, maybe heavenly, heaven isn't going to be as heavenly as I thought, how many of you remember that old episode of The Twilight Zone? where a criminal gets shot by the police and dies and goes to heaven. And he wakes up in heaven where everything is perfect. I mean, he wins every poker game he plays. Women are throwing themselves at his feet, so there's no challenge there. And just as he starts to get really bored, he sees a pool table. <laughs> and he chalks up the cue, and he breaks, and every ball goes in the pocket on the break. Finally, he tells his, his spirit guide, Heaven is boring! I want to go to the other place. And his spirit guide replies, Heaven... Whatever made you think you're in heaven? This is the other place. I guess in the 50s you couldn't say hell on TV, you know, so this is the other place. Well, I would submit to you that if heaven were perfect in the way that most people think it will be perfect, you'd soon be bored out of your gourd, as we used to say. By the way, do you remember the title of that episode, anybody? The title was A Nice Place to Visit. And you know why it was titled that, because you know the rest of that old expression is what? But you wouldn't want to live there. And you know what? If heaven was perfect in the way that most people think of as perfect. It'd be a nice place to visit. The criminal enjoyed himself for a little while, but you wouldn't want to live there any more than he did. You'd be bored out of your mind. Heaven's going heaven's to be a lot like earth 
just without the sin. Uh, that, that enough that in itself is good enough, huh? Well, most people think that in heaven they won't have to go to work. And, you know, you have to admit on some days that does sound pretty heavenly, you know. It'd be nicer to just roll over and go back to bed. But, how many of you think that the Garden of Eden was perfect? Huh? Well, how many of you remember that in the Garden of Eden, Adam had to go to work, didn't he? What, what does your next reference say in Genesis 2.15? The Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to sit back while some angel fed him grapes. <laughs> Is that what yours said? No! Put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Well, heaven's going to be perfect, but you still got to go to work, just like Adam did. I mean, being a judge is a job. <laughs> You'll have to go to work if you're going to judge angels. Not lay back in your recliner with your mouth open while some angel dangles grapes above you and all you got to do is, you know, that'd be nice for maybe a day. But now that we know why somebody is complaining in this taste of heaven here, let's talk about the details of this particular dispute. And to do that, we have to talk about what a Grecian is. <laughs> because Grecians, they weren't just people who spoke Greek. A and you know that because the Bible has another name for people who spoke Greek. You, you see it in your next reference there in Mark 7 and verse 26, where it says the woman was a Greek. A Syrophoenician by nation. People of other nations who spoke Greek were called Greeks in the Bible because Greece had conquered all those other nations. <laughs> but Jews of the Jewish nation who spoke Greek, they were called Grecians. They were Jews who grew up in those other countries and grew up speaking Greek instead of Hebrew like they did in Israel. And the Grecian widows here, these Jewish Greek-speaking widows, were being neglected in something called the daily ministration. You say, well, what's that? Well, remember, they were living with all things common, right? Like you see in your, your next reference in Acts 2.44 and 45. It says, All that believed sold their possessions and goods, parted them to all men as every man had need. Well, for some reason, the needs of these Grecian women were being neglected as they parted their goods to the needy. Now the question is, how'd that happen? Well, it could be because the Jews in Israel who spoke Jewish, who spoke Hebrew, they tended to look down their noses at Jews in other lands who spoke Greek. So, it's tempting to think that they were neglecting these Grecian widows because of that. But you know that can't be what was happening here. Because did you know, purposely neglecting a widow was a sin. According to your next reference in Exodus 22 and verse 22, this is one of many verses in God's Word where it says something like this, Ye shall not afflict any widow, Grecian or otherwise, or the orphans either, or the fatherless children. So neglecting a widow would be a sin. And what do we read in the next verse in Acts 2.4? These guys were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled in such a way that 1 John 3.9 says they could not sin. Well, if they couldn't sin and the widows were being neglected, they weren't being neglected on purpose, were they? So why or how were they being neglected? Well, 
You know, the Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, we do know that once again, being sinless doesn't mean being perfect in the way that we always think of as perfect. Maybe these Grecians were the most recent additions to the church and this ministration system hadn't caught up to them yet. Listen, I don't have to tell you, anytime you get multitudes of people together, it, it multiplies the chances that things are going to go wrong <laughs> and things aren't going to go as smoothly as you would think. But as we read on, the apostles responded to this complaint in verse 2 by saying this, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, here it sounds like the apostles don't care about this problem. But that is not what it means when it says when they said it is not reason that we should look into this. A man's reason is his ability to think, folks. When you tell somebody listen to reason, you mean you've thought something through and you want them to listen so they will think it through. And these apostles here reason that they shouldn't stop studying and teaching the Word of God in order, in order to investigate the cause of this problem and, and figure out how to fix it. Now, that's not because they thought that, this, that doing that would be beneath them. Uh, Pastor Stam, I've told this, this story before, he was one of the best teachers and students of the Word of his day. And yet I'll never forget the communion service at Cedar Lake, the conference one year when he served communion along with a few of the other men. I mean, here's this legend in the grace movement serving me communion. And serving these Grecian widows food on their tables, it says there in verse 2, that wasn't something that they considered beneath them. It was just that they were apostles. And apostles had all of the gifts of the Spirit, all of the spiritual gifts, folks, including the one you read about in Romans 12, verses 6 and 7. Paul says, having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let's wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Folks, these apostles had that gift of teaching. And that verse says you, when you've got that, you're supposed to wait on it. Like a waiter waits on you for your order. So, to look into the, the neglecting of the widows here, those apostles would have had to do some neglecting of their own, wouldn't they? Neglecting like you read in 1 Timothy 4.14 where Paul told Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. The apostles had that gift of teaching and they didn't want to neglect that gift in order to help with this. Hey, if you want to know how important it is for, for spiritual leaders to not neglect the study and teaching of the Word of God they thought it was more important than feeding hungry widows. Listen, don't ever think that our church isn't doing anything important because we're not feeding the homeless. I mean, we're feeding the souls of men here. And God says it wouldn't be reasonable to stop doing that and start 
feeding people physically. If you can do both, that's fine, but this needs to be the priority. Listen, leaders who study and teach the Word of God can't let anything stop them. Not, not the stripes they put on your back like they beat these guys with in chapter 5. And not problems that rise up in the church that threaten to make you stop teaching that just as much like we're seeing here in chapter 6. Because the study and preparation of messages, folks, it takes a significant amount of time. If you've ever done it, you know. Dave's been doing a study of the topical significance of uh, wind, typical, it's a topical message, but it's a, of the typical significance of wind and waves and water in Scripture. And I listened to one of them and he said there's 600 verses about water in the Bible. And you know what he said? He said, I've read them all more than once. And then he had to look at all the references to things like rivers and fountains and streams and pools. I mean, he probably had his face buried in the Bible so long that I'm surprised Sandy remembers what he looks like. <laughs> Who are you, tall, dark, and handsome? <laughs> Come to my house often? <laughs> I'm kidding, but listen. That's what the twelve apostles are choosing to do here. So, rather than neglect their gift, let's read on to see what they propose be done in verse 3, back in your Bible now. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the, and good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So, this is the formula that the apostles chose to deal with the, the Grecian widows. I call this message the, the Grecian formula because you know there's a, there's a hair coloring product for men uh, that goes by that name. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Grecian formula. Alright, I picked a good title. <laughs> and, and what that does is it's solves the problem of gray hair in men, if you think that's a problem. I don't think, you know, us men, we're just, you know, we look more distinguished when we get older and gray, you know. <laughs> it's not fair, is it? But uh, it solves that problem if you think that's a problem. And this formula, as we're going to see, solves this problem. But if, if this solution sounds familiar, it's because the world has a name for it. It's called delegating authority. And listen, it is something that every smart boss does. I mean, where I work, if Pastor Kevin Sadler had to, to do all of our jobs, in addition to studying and preparing for the Transform by Grace television program and all the other stuff that he does, he, he'd be dead in a week. <laughs> he just Instead, he, he delegates authority to us. And we know that God knows this principle because we saw it in our scripture reading this morning, didn't we? We saw Moses adopt this very prince, uh, uh, policy, I should say, when God multiplied the Jews like he did here. In your next reference, I gave you a little snippet of that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 10. He, Moses said to Israel, The Lord your God has multiplied you. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife, your disagreements? So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and well known, and made them heads over you. And I charged your judges, your, I charged the heads that I made over you at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it to me, and I will hear it. Moses knew that judging 
all of Israel all day long would send him to an early grave. So he picked men to help him do that. And when the disciples did that here, it freed the apostles up to do what we read in verse 4 back in your Bible now. The apostle says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, I was thinking about this. This answers a question that I often hear at Brian Bible Society when people email me questions and call in with questions. And that is the question of whether or not we're going to know the Bible perfectly the, the moment we get into heaven. Well, think about it. If these disciples are experiencing heaven on earth and the apostles are giving themselves to the teaching of the Word of God, well, that must mean the disciples needed to learn the Word of God in the kingdom of heaven on earth, don't you think? Hey, if you want to talk about being bored in heaven, how boring would it be to know the Bible instantly, backward and forward, the moment you get to heaven? I mean, with nothing else to learn for all eternity? <laughs> now compare that to how interesting and exciting heaven's going to be as we continue to learn the Word of God for all eternity. Folks, this is, a, this is an eternal book. And I think we're going to spend eternity learning it. As you're seeing pictured here in this taste of the kingdom of heaven. But now, what we're seeing in this chapter is an example of something that oftentimes happens in churches even today. These disciples survived the, the attacks that came to their church from outside the church, from their religious leaders who were threatening to kill them last chapter and, and beating them. They survived the, the attacks from without, only to have these problems come in from within that threatened to dismantle the church just as much as those attacks. But, unlike a lot of churches today, this church knew what to do about it. And that is to let their leaders do what the apostles did and give themselves to the study and teaching of the Word. The prayerful, prayerful study and teaching of the Word, by the way. I hope you know that's how you're supposed to study the Word of God. <clears throat> when I study the Bible, I study it prayerfully. I, I mean, I'm always asking God, well, what does that mean? <laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to say in this verse? What are you trying to get across in this passage of Scripture? And I, I'll tell you, when I study like that, it's like heaven on earth. Just like these guys are experiencing here. And you can have that too if you'll prayerfully study the Word of God. Say, what does it mean, Lord? What are you trying to say? And... How could I apply this to my life? That's another prayer you want to be praying as you're learning the Word of God. Alright, let's read on and find out how the church liked the, the Grecian formula <laughs> that the apostles were proposing as we read on in verse, six, uh, verse 5 in your Bible. It says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose... Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip, <coughs> excuse me, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, we're not going to talk about each of these men individually because, well, for one thing, we're going to talk about Stephen, the first guy, plenty, <laughs> in, in Acts chapter 7 in the next chapter. And we're going to talk about that other guy, Philip, 
in chapter 8. And to be honest, the rest of those guys that are mentioned there, they're only mentioned there. In the, in the Bible, there's, there's nothing else we can know about them. But there is one thing that we can know about all of them. And that is that they were all Grecians. I mean, you know that because those are not Hebrew names, folks. Those are Grecian names. That means they picked Grecian men to look into the problem of the neglect of the Grecian widows. You know, I, I was thinking about that. that. That's kind of the opposite of that old expression, the fox is guarding the hen house. Did you ever hear that? You wouldn't pick a fox to guard a house that he himself was most likely to rob, right? <laughs> but these disciples picked Grecian leaders who were most likely to side with the Grecian widows. Right? Now, compare that to what these Jewish leaders could have done to solve and address this issue. I mean, they could have said, you know what? This is a Jewish church, so we're going to pick seven Jewish guys to look into this, and if you don't like it, you can pack your duds and hit the four lane and go somewhere else, right? Of course, if they did that, any unbelievers seeing that would criticize them, and rightly so, and say, you know, you should have put, picked three Hebrews and three Grecians and maybe one proselyte. And you know what? In the eyes of unsaved men, that would be the fairest way on earth to settle the issue, right? I mean, the world thinks that nobody on the planet could come up with, with a better solution than that. But God did, didn't He? He thought of a solution that unsaved men would never think of. Because it's a solution of grace. Grace goes above and beyond the call of duty, folks. And your next reference, after talking about the dispensation of grace in Ephesians 3, Paul went on to say in verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. That power of grace that, that works in us today, or should, was working in these disciples here in Acts chapter 6. When those Grecians complained about the neglect of their widows, the church answered exceeding abundantly abundantly above what those Grecians could have asked or even thought to ask. Would you have thought to ask? Yeah, and put, all, put, put seven Grecians on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the committee. And you know what? Today, when someone encroaches on you, crosses the line, gets in your face, Instead of getting upset about it, if you can respond with grace, you'll be responding not only like these saints here, but like God Himself. That's how He responds when we cross the line with Him, isn't it? And you'll experience the kind of heaven on earth that these, these disciples were. Listen, last week I saw some grace believers ungraciously do what Paul says not to do when he says, think no evil of other grace believers. And let me tell you, it made a mess. It just makes a mess. But now, before we read on and get past these names, I will say one thing about one of the names. This guy, Nicholas. And that is, and this is speculation, he might be one of the ones John was talking about in your next reference in 1 John 2.18 and 19 where he says, There are many Antichrists that went out from us. 
In those days, folks, there was a group of men who, well, after these days in Pentecost, later on, John's writing this epistle, he says there was a group of men that went out from this church and became antichrists. And I think Nicholas might have been one of them. You say, well, what in the world would make you think that? Well, it's because of what the Lord said in your next reference when he was writing to, prophetically, true, uh, to congratulate some of the believers in Revelation 2.6. He said, but this thou hast, you, you got this going for you, he tells this church, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Hmm. Can you see how a cult named the Nicolaitans might have been founded by a guy named Nicholas? Now, we're not, when it says there, you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible what those deeds were. But you know what? John gives us a clue when he later on goes on to say and tells a different group of people in Revelation 2, 14 and 15, he says, I got a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that commit fornication. And look what he says about that. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So, whatever the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, whatever their doctrine was, it seems to have had to do with fornication, right? And if Nicholas was one of the ones we read about here in your next reference in Acts 4.32, which we know he was, the ones who said neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Well, maybe Nicholas got a little carried away with that and started saying that men shouldn't say that their wives were their own. That they should have all things common. Even their wives. Let me ask you, would that tend to lead to fornication? The question answers itself, doesn't it? Now, I would never have thought of that. In fact, I've studied Revelation too many times and thought, well, who in the world are the Nicolaitans? And... But church history says that that's what happened. That that's what this guy... Now, you, you've heard me say a bazillion times, and I hope I say it a bazillion times more, you can't trust church history because they tend to make things up. But why you can't trust church history... I, I have to say, I've heard worse theories. This one at least seems to have some scripture behind it. And all I can tell you is if I'm wrong, just, just, just remind me to apologize to Nicholas when, when we get to heaven. And, and I'll be glad to do that. But something to think about when you're studying Revelation next time. Alright, now that uh, they've chosen these men to look into the problem, all that was left to do was ordain them. In verse 6. Acts 6 6, back in your Bible now, it says, speaking of those guys whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now, today, when we ordain men to the ministry, we tend to do that, we, but it's a symbolic kind of a thing. Uh, Virginia's in the Philippines right now, but when I was there speaking at their national conference, they had about a dozen men they were ordaining into the ministry, and each of us pastors put our hand on the shoulder of one of them during part of the ceremony there as, as, a, as, a, as a picture of this. But in those days, they were actually able to miraculously convey a spiritual gift like the one you read about in that verse where well, we already read it out I'm giving you a part of it again in Romans 12 6 and 7 having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us whether prophecy let's prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry 
if you've got that gift, he says, let's wait on our ministry. Well, doesn't that sound like the kind of gift that would help in the daily ministration? Yeah. Now finally, in the last verse of our text, in Acts 6 and verse 7, we see the kind of effect that showing grace like they were showing, the kind of effect that that can have in the hearts of men. Look at, look at verse 7. It says the Word of God increased. It was multiplying in verse 1. Now it's increasing. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, you know, up until now, you know Israel's priests have been against the preaching of the apostles. But when they saw how, how graciously they handled this situation, the situation, the, the, this problem with the Grecian widows, it caused not just a few, it says a great company of priests join them. So I suggest to you, if we could learn to be that gracious when solving the disputes that we have with other believers, you think maybe that might show unbelievers that you've got something that they don't have. And maybe cause them to want to join you. Hey, just, just two chapters ago, these priests were some of the ones you're reading about in your next reference in Acts 4, 1-3, to as they, they spake to the people, the priests, and the captain of the people and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people. And you read on, it says they threw them in jail. Two chapters ago, the priests were grieved with the preaching of Christ. Now they've joined the ones that are preaching Christ. Who knows, folks? Maybe, maybe that kind of grace in your life will turn somebody around in your life that, that up until now has been grieved with your preaching of Christ. Right? Finally, when it says that these priests were obedient to the faith, that means they got saved. Listen, if God says you got to do something to get saved, your faith has to obey what God says to do. That's the obedience of faith. And what Peter told them to do in Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one you've been resisting, for the remission of sins. That was the faith that had to be obeyed if you wanted to be saved at Pentecost. But listen, to be baptized, as Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ, that means they had to do something else. Something else that Israel's rulers didn't want to do. Something you read about in your next reference. In John 4, 12, 42, among the chief rulers... Many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not what? They didn't confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. <laughs> well, listen, you're not going to publicly get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ unless you're willing to publicly confess that Jesus is your Christ, right? But that's what they had to do to be saved. Isn't that what the Lord said in Matthew 10.32? Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, I'll deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Now if you're not saved this morning, you too have to be obedient to the faith. Only the faith that you have to be obedient to is different. Water baptism is what they had to do to be obedient to the faith, right? But our Apostle Paul says that he was made a apostle for a different reason, right? Romans 1.5 says he received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. 
Hey, Peter was talking to the men of the nation of Israel. That's what they had to do to be obedient to the faith. Paul says, I was made an apostle for obedience to the faith among all nations. And he was given a different gospel for the nations to obey, as you see in your next reference. Romans 16.25 where he talks about my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He says it's now made manifest to all nations for the obedience of faith. Paul's new gospel, well, it involved preaching Christ, right? Just like it says. But it involves preaching Him according to the revelation of the mystery. It's the gospel He gives in your, re your last reference. Where He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, I declare to you the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, by which gospel you are saved. How that Christ died for our sins and that He was buried, and that He rose again. And if you know your Bible, you know He never adds any works to that. He doesn't add water baptism to that. He doesn't add anything to that. That's the Gospel you have to believe to be obedient to the faith. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we pause now as a group of believers to pray for those who might not be saved, who might hear this message. We do ask, Father, that the gospel will be clear to them, that all the religious confusion that has surrounded the simple gospel of salvation for 2,000 years will be dissipated from their minds, and they'll just trust Christ and Him alone for their salvation. And then, Father, what a challenge You've laid before us this morning as believers to do exceedingly abundantly above all people could ask or think when it comes to being gracious. We lay that burden before uh, on our hearts and before Your throne today, and we do it in the Savior's name. Amen.